Welcome to those of you who are attending the talk in talk room one. We are about to kick off with a Python-based radio astronomy correlator, which sounds very fancy. Um, to be brutally honest, I'm not entirely sure what it's about. I have a degree in electronic engineering. I should know what it's about. It's been a while. Um, our speaker this morning is James Smith the lead digital signal processing engineer for the Meerkat Extension GPU Correlator project. It's quite a long business card you've got, James, you must say, yeah. 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 <laughs> he has worked at Sorio for the past seven years, um, working on a variety of things, including S FPGAs, moving over to GPU-based correlator development, using Python all the way along the way. Um, Competence in one domain, as he points out, obviously doesn't carry over to all the domains, given that he frequently cannot get his bicycle to work, but I think that's true of bicycles in general. And I think, James, let's go. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you um, Kim. Yes, my, my name is James Smith. Uh, and no, that's not a pseudonym, it's my real name. The reason that it's a common name is a lot of people have it, so I try to convince people that I'm not just try, uh, impersonating someone else on the internet. Um, so... I, I do know what a Python-based radio astronomy correlator does, and I'm, I'm hoping that at the end of this uh, talk that um, I'll be able to, to tell you a little bit about it. Uh, just a, a bit of a um, caveat. I'm used to presenting to more radio astronomy familiar audiences, so if, if I use jargon that people don't understand, just throw something at me and, and I'll, um, I'll explain. Um, so briefly, uh, I, the three main parts, I'm going to give more or less the background of, of what you need to understand in order to know what a correlator is and why, why we, need to, we need to have one. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of the, of the technical challenges that we uh, encounter and, and how we've overcome them and uh, the cool Python stuff that we've done and why it might be interesting for you to get involved if you'd like to do so. Um, so first of all, what is radio astronomy? Uh, so you've probably all heard of you know, Hubble Space Telescope and all these kinds of things. We can look out into the universe. And that happens kind of in this uh, very narrow band of, of the electromagnetic spectrum, which is optical. But the universe emits at all sorts of frequencies. So some of them we can observe from the Earth. Some of them we can't. So we have space-based uh, telescopes. But radio astronomy operates down over here, um, where we've got frequencies quite low. Uh, or wavelengths qu quite a bit longer. Um, it, so yeah, much much more on the spectrum than just visible light. Uh, radio astronomy in South Africa specifically, uh, it has a bit of a history from humble beginnings. So um, uh, many 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 years ago, NASA built a ground station at Hook near near Johannesburg uh, because they need to um, for their deep space network. So the Earth inconveniently rotates quite a lot, once every day in fact, uh, and for a th you know, roughly a third of the day you can't see the, you know, for example, the rover on Mars or the moon or whatever. Um, so you, and you need to be able to communicate with it, so they have a network around the world, and this was part of it until 1974 when they got a bigger, uh, a bigger, better one in Spain. So this was handed over to South Africa and has been converted to a radio astronomy facility. Um, it's quite a globally important one for reasons that I'll get into, but uh, apart from chugging, chugging along, not really much happened uh, for three decades until 2007 or so, where we built our second radio telescope. So this is a 15 meter composite dish. It is creatively named the, the 15 meter, uh, and it's at the same uh, facility uh, at Hardebeer's Took near Johannesburg. The reason that we built it was basically to prove to ourselves that we can, that we can build a radio astronomy dish because the first one was built by the Americans. We've done maintenance, we've done a few upgrades, but we haven't actually, we hadn't actually built a new one from scratch until then. And so this one is that one. When it comes to telescopes, both in the radio and in the optical domain, uh, bigger is better. So this is an example of a, a radio telescope. This is in Green Bank in the uh, in um, West Virginia in the States. It's not the biggest radio telescope, but it's the largest fully steerable one, and it is massive. Uh, the resolution is not great, but these little things are cars down here. This is ginormous, um, and it comes with a similarly ginormous price tag 
It's very good, but it's also very, very expensive, disproportionately so. So we're not going to build one of those. Uh, I'm going to tell you about what an interferometer is. So if you can't build a bigger telescope all in one go, you can have a lot of little telescopes and combine them uh, after the fact in post-processing. So this is the Very Large Array in New Jersey, USA. So that has 27 or 28 antennas, I believe. And so they each point to, well, they all point to the same space, except for these two, they're probably being maintained or something like that. And then the signals are all combined uh, in this sort of processing array here. This big building is to do telescope maintenance. This is a very clever one because all of the antennas are on rails, so you can actually drive it like a train and come to the building here for maintenance if you, if you need to. But it's also quite expensive. That's how the Americans do things. So back in the 90s, um, some ast astronomers had the great idea of a newer, larger than ever um, radio telescope. Interestingly, this time the states was not involved, so they, they're usually the leaders in doing things bigger and better. Um, the, uh, the sort of metric that they uh, uh, said a target was a collecting area of uh, a square kilometer. So it was very creatively named the square kilometer array. Uh, it needed a good home base. If you want to build a good instrument, you need to uh, a good telescope. You need to put it in a place where uh, radio astronomy is good to do. So South Africa was a, a candidate for that. And uh, back in 2012, um, we were selected as a um, host country. So the 15 meter telescope that I mentioned earlier was a sort of a first attempt to prove to ourselves that we could do it. Um, but that was just a single antenna. We needed interferometers. So um, we built a couple of precursors. So the first one to prove to the international community that we could do it, but to ourselves as well, uh, was this one. This is CAT-7. Um, CAT stands for Kuru Array Telescope. Seven, because there are seven elements. So straightforward. It was also composite dishes, very similar to the 15 meter one uh, I mentioned previously. But this time it had a correlator. So the, um, the data from the seven elements, or the seven antennas is combined to give you a unified product that is greater than the sum of all the yeah. all the individual parts. Uh, that was just, CAT7 was really only intended as a stepping stone to something greater. This is Meerkat, and the naming is brilliant. Mir Kat. Does net Mir. The fact that there are Meerkats in the career is completely coincidental. That is how the, the name of the telescope came around. Um, the, the idea behind Meerkat is that it eventually gets folded into to SKA when it, when the international community comes and starts building their dishes. And it started, but the you know, scheduling delays, these kinds of things. So we've got to operate Meerkat for a little bit longer than what we originally anticipated. And so we're going to be extending it. Um, I don't have any pictures of that because we haven't built it yet. Uh, but that's the project that I'm, that I'm working on. Um, so it's coming soon. Watch this space. So a correlator. Now, this is the name for the machine that combines the, uh, the signals from all of these individual antennas into one. And unfortunately, so at this point, I must apologize. The pictures are going to start getting less interesting. Um, they are not much to look at. They're just electronics that get stuck in a rack. So this is part of the, um, the first VLA correlator. I showed you the VLA earlier. It's, it's not the entire thing. There's lots of that, but it's really just more of the same. So the best kind of, you get two main kinds of correlators. The best kind is a real-time one. So it produces its output products w live while the observation is busy taking place. So at, when, you s when the observation is finished, when the, the target goes over the horizon, you can't see it anymore, immediately or nearly immediately, you have a data set that the scientists can start using to do their science. And usually, this means the dedicated hardware needs to be built. Um, the other kind of correlators are uh, offline or batch processing, and that shifts the computation into perhaps a, a slightly easier domain. You don't need dedicated hardware for it. You can just use normal computers. But you, you do need a way to record the data very, very quickly. So this is a Mark V recorder, which is used in very long baseline interferometry. Um, this is one of the reasons that why that Hartrow is uh, globally important, because uh, it's gives a, a very important baseline uh, and very very useful for the for international 
VLBI observations. So what they do is each antenna, uh, one might be in England, one might be in Spain, one might be in Sweden, one might be in South Africa, and they all record their, their an antenna data directly onto hard drives. And in the old days, that would get put in a packet and sent with, well, probably not the post office, but it would be physically sent to a central location uh, where it would be plugged into a, a, a machine that looks very much the same, but it does the opposite thing. It reads the data off, and it does the correlation uh, using software written for the purpose in normal computers. Um, so it's cor uh, offline correlators are easier to do because it, it's just software. It can be done in batches. It, it can take a very long time uh, to process your data. South African uh, correlators, so the, the precursors uh, that, that I mentioned, CAT7 and Meerkat, have a bit of the best of both worlds in that we have real-time correlators um, that produce the, your data product immediately when you've finished with the observation, but they're not specialized hardware. So this is an FPGA uh, board, so for those who are not um, electronic engineers or for those uh, that have qualified a long time ago but might not be able to remember, uh, <laughs> possibly like him, Hypothetically, <laughs> um, but uh, so FPGA is a field programmable gate array, which means it's a basically a, a logic device that you can program with any kind of logic that you want. If you want to, you can put a, a microprocessor on it or something more specialized, uh, and that can be reflashed electronically live. So uh, this this particular board can do one thing one minute, and if you flash it again, you can do another thing uh, com entirely. That means that you don't need to worry about designing new hardware every time. You can just update the firmware. Um, it is not quite as simple and fast as re redeploying new software. Um, the FPGA logic is quite challenging, but certainly not as, as rebuilding the hardware from, and manufacturing from, from scratch. There are currently about 280 of these boards de deployed in the Karoo, uh, doing the, the hard work of the correlation for the Meerkat uh, correlator. OK, so I'm going to have to talk a little bit about maths. Um, there are, there are so, there are two important concepts that you need to understand. This isn't maths. This is just a little bit of geometry um, to explain where the, the concept is coming from. So, in this diagram of um, a, a very simple case, you can imagine that the electromagnetic radiation coming from the universe um, is going to reach the two antennas of this very simple interferometer at slightly different times. And so there'll be a time delay. It's represented by tau in this diagram. Uh, you you know that geometrically, so you can work out more or less what it is by the you know the di the distance and the speed of light, and these kinds of things. And it's by measuring this phase that we get the interesting information, um, the scientific information from the universe. The reason why this works is actually very interesting, but it's the topic of a, a lecture all by itself. So I won't go too too much into that. But the important thing to remember is that it's the it's this phase between the two signals at these antennas that's the important one so two mathematical contexts are critical so brace yourselves the first one is multiplication okay specifically complex conjugate multiplication but it's basically the same you you remember that uh from your high school maths career dig back in the in in the um in the distant past but you remember that there's a trigonometric identity that if you multiply uh, two sine waves, to, uh, sine uh, functions together, you get an output that's proportional to the sum and the difference. It's a similar kind of thing there. By multiplying the signals together, you you get very accurate information about the phase between the between them. Um, then the second important concept is addition. That easy. Just like a uh, if you put. If you try and uh, take a photo uh, uh, in a dark environment, you need to open your shutter a little bit longer, so a long exposure to get more signal in. This is exactly what we're doing with addition. So we're doing lots of multiplications, and then we're adding a, a few of them together to increase the signal-to-noise ratio. That's it. And uh, now you know all that you need to know to go and code up your own uh, correlator uh, at home. So thank you, and uh, any questions? No, not, not quite. Uh, there is a little bit more maths. Um, don't be frightened. <laughs> I have. I might just have oversimplified things ever so slightly. What uh, so the what I've set up to now is 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 true, but it's strictly only true in the case of very narrowband signals. 
So that trig identity of uh, you know sine of x plus or times sine of y, it's true only really at a single frequency. So this is, it, it might look frightening, but it's a Fourier transform. And if you've played with a hi-fi, you know what it is. Uh, you can decompose a signal into all its different frequency components. So you, you can have your trebles and your mids and your bass. That you can do the same thing with radio waves. And then that gives you, it makes your life much simpler because you can decompose this into you know, maybe 8,000 uh, frequency channels, uh, which are very narrow band over your, over your bandwidth. And then you can just do the uh, multiplication and addition, and it's very easy. So due to um, developments in mathematics and computer science, Fourier transforms are actually very computationally efficient to evaluate. So uh, this one's quite fast. Okay, so why is specialized hardware so often required if the computation is so easy? The problem is actually um, not the, the number crunching by itself, it's moving the data around fast enough. So um, getting, so your, your laptop could probably do a lot of this, probably not the whole array, but getting the data onto your laptop to process it quickly enough and then getting it off again for that to be useful to be done in real time, that's, that's really the challenge. However, um, okay, so in the past, when we started building radio telescopes, uh, commercially available hardware that, could, that had this particular set of characteristics was not available. So uh, we did what any respecting set of scientists would do. We built our own, and it was very excellent in every way. But it is uh, expensive, and it distracts us from the job that we really want to do, which is really just the radio astronomy. So for Meerkat Extension, uh, we, we are levering, leveraging some shiny new technology, which so the, the rest of the industry has caught up, thanks in, in no small part to um, machine learning. Gordon, we're, I don't see Gordon here. Uh, but that crowd, which is, which is much more profitable than um, radio astronomy, so that it has driven the technology. So we're going to make use of that, which has largely solved uh, many of our uh, problems. Um, so there are, there are three main things that have, that have helped us so far. Uh, the first is Ethernet. So Ethernet has been good enough for quite a while now. The, um, this is the Scarab. This is the, um, the platform that's being used in Meerkat. It, it has 40 gigabit Ethernet in it. Cat7 previously used 10 gigabit Ethernet. And uh, so the Ethernet is very good. So individual compute nodes are connected by an Ethernet connection. So we don't, we don't need to design a backplane. We don't need to design fancy protocols or anything like that. Just plug it in and uh, we can use a switch, and that's very easy. Um, okay, the next de development that's, that's been important has been uh, Fast PCI uh, Express. I don't have a picture of that. Uh, it's, uh, couldn't find a picture of PCI Express as a concept. But this, what that is, is getting data from, so you've got data from the network, and it's entering your, your node, uh, at its network interface, and you need to get it to your processing element. Then, the Scarab. If I go a slide back, this is, these are these are the network interfaces, and they're wired directly into the FPGA. So there's there's not uh, not really a fancy bus to worry about. The the latency is very low, the bandwidth is very high, so that can have the processing. Uh, it can process the data at full at full bandwidth. Computers uh, struggled with this until PCIe 4 came along. And um, and are they good enough? And the final thing is uh, GPUs. So GPUs have actually been fast enough for quite a while. Uh, we prototyped the concept of the software uh, of the software correlator on a, a GeForce 1000, uh, 1000 series card from like 75 years ago. Um, but it's but that was a PCIe 3 Gen card. So with the latest, well, okay. As of the announcement a couple of weeks ago, not the latest anymore. The previous gen RTX 3000 series cards were RPCIe4, and that's the, so those are the ones we're using. Um, you can see here the glow of the RGB lighting, which is very important to the <laughs> correlator performance. So that is included with every with every compute node that we've got. And so this is what we what we've got. So we. Uh, our correlator lives in, in the cloud in GitHub, and its name is CAT GPU CBF. So CAT is stands for, as every all of our software modules are called CAT something. Um, GPU uh, is the, 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 the platform, and CBF stands for Correlator Beamformer, which is just the internal sort of 
uh, naming scheme that we that we use, and it's open source, so you can go down and if, uh, you can go and download it. And if you happen to have a telescope array of your own at home, you can correlate it very, very easily. Uh, I'm going to show you how it works. So uh, imagine for yourself uh, a, a, a computer system. Uh, the fonts are not really working with us, but this this block rec represents system memory. This is GPU memory. Uh, at the bottom here, we've got a NIC, and then we've got our CPU on the side, which is coordinating things. Uh, and within each of these sort of sets of memory, uh, we ha we pre-allocate uh, large-ish buffers, uh, which get recircled. So they're, they're circular buffers, so we don't have to delete them and, and create allocate new ones continuously. So data comes in off your net network, gets written into the first buffer in the queue. When it gets full, the it starts filling up the next buffer. And while that's happening, we we realize that it's full and we say, all right, this is a, a thing that can be started to transfer to the GPU. Once that's done, the GPU starts to process. So it's got some an input buffer and an output buffer. GPU starts pr its processing. While it's processing, uh, the next set of data is busy being transferred to the GPU because it can handle a few things at once. Um, and then we end up with a situation like that. So once the processing is finished, uh, the data gets copied back to, transferred back to system memory. In the meantime, the next batch can start to be processed. And uh, then uh, once it's all there, then it can start to be transferred out on the network to its next uh, destination. There are several stages in the, in the correlator, several stages in the pipeline. And ultimately, once the correlator produces an output that's also going to the, uh, from the network to, uh, well, we do the, the transform step. If you think of it as the ETL pipeline, but for radio astronomy, this is the transform step, and it goes downstream to another subsystem, which does the load, which stores it in the in the format that the scientists are going to use it for their their data. Uh, and in the yeah, and in the meantime, so if you can imagine this dance going on on a continuous basis, as soon as one batch is ready, it gets transferred to the next stage, uh, and then the, the work gets started. And uh, on the CPU, there's a Python script that's busy coordinating this dance to make sure that uh, all of these things happen in the right times. So uh, if, you've, if you've tried any GPU programming at all, uh, CUDA calls it a stream, or OpenCL calls it a command queue. Uh, and you have events, which are little like semaphores, blocks, locks, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but it's the same kind of concept from, from threading or, or any sort of concurrent programming to tell um, so that two streams or two um, threads can communicate with each other to say, all right, the copy is finished, now the processing can start. And once that's done, we can recycle the memory and we can start the processing. And similarly, an event will tell us that the processing is finished, we can copy uh, back to the host, and this buffer can be recycled. And that is how that dance happens. So there are a couple, in, uh, a few different pipelining stages, and the, so the, in each ca case, the, DS, the actual DSP logic changes, whether it's the cross-correlation uh, part or the uh, the frequency decomposition part. But the the, the overall um, functioning of the DSP engines uh, works the same in both cases. Okay, so why Python? Uh, it's because Python is great. There's lots of handy stuff that Python has that makes this process a lot easier. So the first that you may be familiar with is async IO. Um, it's, uh, we usually think of it in terms of, of um, uh, IO kind of stuff that so you make a network request and wait for a result to come back. It's good for that, but it's also good for, as we've seen, coordinating um, stuff that happens uh, on the GPU. So you start a copy and you can use async IO uh, and that await keyword to wait for that to finish and then recycle memory buffers, that sort of thing. Um, Python's buffer protocol. So allocating and manip manipulating all the, the memory buffers that I mentioned earlier, is v Python's got very, very useful for that. So NumPy arrays are a good example of the buff buffer protocol in action. Uh, PyCuda is a, there, there are, GPUs are programmed either in, in CUDA or in OpenCL, which is a, m both are more C, C++ based kind of things, but there are Python bindings. Uh, and you, uh, so you need one of these kind of modules in order to get the GPU out of bed to actually do something. And PyCUDA is one that plays nicely, um, which we've used in this case. So it, it works very nicely with NumPy and uh, the aforementioned buffer protocol. So they, 
they can pass objects around between them quite easily. Number is another one which you may or may not be familiar with. Uh, number Numbers uh, party trick is that it can do just-in-time compilation. So you can write code in Python and it JIT compiles it for you for two possible reasons, uh, but both of which I'll go into in a moment. And then, of course, uh, testing to make sure that everything works. I'm going to be talking more about the testing in my next talk tomorrow, so I'm not going to spend too much time on that today. In addition to uh, the community modules that everyone else can use, we've rolled a, a, a bit of a few of our own, which uh, when we've had need to do to do so. Again, I apologize for the way we name things. Cat SDP SIGPROC. Okay, cat is the what every, everything starts with cat. SDP stands for Science Data Processor, which is the if you think about the correlator as the T part of the uh, ETL pipeline. SDP is the L, the the the, the load part. And um, SIGPROC stands for signal processing. So this is a module. It's got wrapper functions around either PyCUDA or OpenCL and handles a lot of the boilerplate stuff, allocating buffers, making sure that they're the right size, quality of life improvements for working with GPUs in general. Speed2 uh, is an implementation of an in-house data streaming protocol, which uh, operates over the high-speed network. Um, it facilitates low-level ac access to networking hardware to make things fast. It's written in C++, but with Python bindings. Uh, VKGDR is a, uh, a wrapper around the Vulkan API to map uh, the GPU's memory into the system's uh, memory, uh, uh, the host's memory address space to, to help speed up those transfers. Uh, AIO CAT CP, so that is an implementation of, a, of the CAT control protocol, which is uh, a simple uh, TCP protocol by which all of the subsystems of our telescope talk to each other. And this is just an implementation of that protocol, uh, as the name suggests, written to work very well with um, async IO. Uh, all of these are functionally uh, just um, Sereo internal ones. We're not the only ones that use it. Uh, well, shall I say we, when I say we, I mean my, my, my team that does correlator. So my colleagues are from various teams in the organization. Much of this is open source, so if you have an application that you think could use that, I mean, it's it's available on uh, on PyPI if you want it. Um, okay, so now uh, engineering challenges, tips and tricks, things that we've found that we had to do that we've learned, uh, is that you need to have large work chunks. So for a GPU to even be remotely uh, efficient at processing things, you need lots of parallelism, like think about, about millions of threads that's the sort of thing that gets a GPU excited. Um, so, so each block here in that diagram come from previously is on the order of hundreds of megabytes. Certainly, even your biggest network packets are only about nine kilobytes. Uh, so if you were to vo invoke the Python interpreter every time you receive a packet, you'd have a situation that is very, very slow. So you build up quite a, quite a number of megabytes of data and then pass that up into Python land as a chunk and then that can trans get transferred around with very low overhead very efficiently. Okay, chunk placement. So this um, this is an interesting thing. This is, uh, I mentioned earlier, just-in-time compilation, and uh, often that is done for performance reasons. So Python is slow, so we just-in-time compile it to something uh, compiled, and then it can run very fast. But that's not the only reason that you might want to do that. So a little bit of background. The network, the stuff that's coming in on the network, it's UDP traffic, so the, the it's not guaranteed that it's going to come in the right order. It's not even from the same source, so it might be there might be some confusion around this. Um, and but individual packets contain metadata. This is the speed protocol that I mentioned earlier, that may uh, that metadata that indicates where they come from and what they contain. So for example, the which antenna they came from, the timestamp, uh, the frequency channel, what uh, these sorts of things. Uh, and the speed 2 module, which is written in C++, has the facility to uh, arrange these packets in these big chunks, but it doesn't know before the time uh, how the, the user wants to arrange these packets in, in that memory. Um, so we can write that logic in C++ if we want to, but we'd rather not. So uh, if we can stay just, uh, just write Python code, we'd, we'd prefer to avoid that. Um, and as I said earlier, passing each individual packet up into Python space to use a Python function to place it would, would be far too slow. Uh, so we define the logic in friendly familiar Python, and then 
using number, we can JRT compile it so that the C++ module can use it. So this is practically what that looks like, and I'll only have two slides of code. Uh, it's, it, it's challenging to look at code on a screen and reason about it, but the, it's just a normal f a Python function, not very frightening at all. We define a little bit of, of um, this. We extract the metadata to, to see, you know, give ourselves a, a handle on wh where the packet is coming from and what it's doing. And this just tell, uh, fills in this little structure over here, data, um, fills in the details about where that packet needs to go in the bigger chunk. Uh, you decorate it with number.cfunk and uh, give it a little bit of a, a signature there. And then that will compile it. And right, so um, scipy.lowlevel callable gives you access to a function pointer given the, the object that number has, has worked with. It, you do need to give it a signature, but that gives you a nice Python handle so that you can pass it down to your, your receiver. And then it can use that logic to, to build up your chunks. There are pros and cons. Um, unfortunately, C++ still exists. Um, so if you're, if you're trying to write this kind of logic, it, you almost have to know about how C++ works to write function signatures and use the pointers and these kinds of things. But when you're installing the modules, you don't have to have a separate C++ compiler, uh, which does make it a lot easier to just pip install. Um, and number, number handles the hard work for you. And the, be the best part is we can benefit from the speed of having stuff compiled down. So that's just an, an example of something interesting that we've, uh, an interesting thing that we've done with Python uh, in, the, in the, the, the course of um, building this correlator. So in conclusion, um, takeaways that I'd like to sort of suggest from this uh, presentation, uh, outsource hardware development if possible. Economies of scale are a thing and it's much more uh, cost effective and stable and mature to use a product that, say, NVIDIA or AMD have made than to try and design our own. Uh, and that allows us to focus on the, the business logic of uh, actually doing astronomy. Uh, Real-time software correlators are now a thing. Uh, it, the, as far as I know, they were never a thing before. So we've got the first one uh, in the world. Uh, and making use of stable and mature things like number, Python, um, num uh, NumPy, and others have uh, made the process a lot smoother. And yeah, okay, so going software only doesn't eliminate challenges entirely. Despite these things, um, we, so we, have, we haven't finished building the correlator yet. If the pandemic hadn't happened, we, we heard we would have, but so we, we, we'll blame that. Uh, that and of course, cryptocurrency mania made it very difficult to get GPUs for a long time. Uh, fortunately, that has abated a little bit. Um, and yet despite all of these things, the Meerkat CBF, uh, Meerkat extension correlator beamformer will be built in a shorter time with fewer engineers and with less budget than the original correlator for Meerkat. Um, fingers crossed. So it's, on, it's aiming for mid-2024. Watch this space. Meerkat already done good science, and Meerkat extension will continue to do that, to do good science. Uh, and the coming of SKA to South Africa in a few years means that radio astronomy uh, will keep engineers and programmers uh, busy for many years to come. Okay, that's that's it. Um, thank you. Fantastic, thank you, James. As it turns out, I just needed a brief refresher. I know all that stuff. It's fine. No, no. Well, send us your CV then, Kim. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Okay, forget I said that. Um, <laughs> more seriously, um, that was absolutely fascinating, and congratulations. That is the world's first, and it certainly sounds like it. That's Thank brilliant. You. Thank that's you. Very good work, guys. Yeah. Got a couple of online comments, and then I'll open for, for questions from the floor. Um, first of all, Diana Polo points out she's got PTSD from hearing the word FPGA, which, frankly, <laughs> um, I, I can sympathize with. Well, I, yeah. My condolences. <laughs> There is a question, Gert from Eerden has asked, what are the specs for the GPU cards being used on the machines? So um, we've actually, uh, just before we got on the plane, we signed a purchase request for uh, uh, RTX 3070 Ti's, and we're getting quotations back. I think I got one this morning, in fact. Um, so yeah, they're just normal gamer cards. They're not the highest end ones. Uh, like I said, the compute is actually not the, the biggest deal, even a mid-range one. 
So we had to pick one that had sufficient uh, memory bandwidth to get to handle the, the, the transfers. So, but it's not in anything insane. Perfect, thanks. Uh, do we have any questions from the floor? Anybody got anything they want to ask? Or are we stunned into to silence now? Okay. So you mentioned that um, the packets you get in UDP, mm -hmm. uh, do you get any packet loss? Um, uh, yes and no. Um, n networking hardware, so we've, we've been using uh, what was Mellanox and what is now NVIDIA networking, um, uh, networking hardware. They're the ones that uh, sort of won the tender bid back in 2014 or 15 when, when Meerkat was put in the first time. The, the hardware is very good. It took a bit of tweaking, but under normal conditions, we can operate at like 95 to 98 percent of the link speed and not drop packets. Sometimes things go wrong, and generally, if you drop one packet, you drop a million, and then that's red lights start flashing, and people get woken up at, at two in the morning. Ask me how I know. Um, with problems saying there's, you know, we've had is issues on site. So, in normal operating conditions, no, we don't drop packets. Um, if things start to go wrong, then obviously they do get dropped, but uh, but that's the system is relatively mature now, so that's more the exception than the rule these days. Perfect, thanks, James. Any further questions? Any? Oh, Dave's got one. I mean, kind of related to that. Uh, so around these little UDP packets. So if you get that big red light, is there a replay that happens, or is that lost forever? That display? actually is uh, something that's quite interesting, and um, I'm not. I'm not entirely sure what I'm allowed to tell you there because it's because we we are under NDAs from um, from vendors. But I th I think they so our current um, the current network that we've got the system that we've got uh, doesn't have instant replay functionality. Uh, it it begins a bit of an iterative process uh, of okay, well, what are the common things that we can check? Um, the the newer generation switch hardware uh, does have better analytics. Um, and I, I'm not sure what what of the information is public and what is not. Uh, so I uh, I can go and find out if you if you're interested and in, and and share that information offline. But but the it but it is coming. So part of our ne our, our next generation system it might might be a, a feature. I think they call it what just happened or something like that. I I, I, I would need to go and figure out the details. Oh, that's a great name. What just happened? I like it. <laughs> Anybody else? Any any further questions? Or otherwise, I think, thank you very much, James. That was absolutely brilliant. It was thoroughly interesting. Thank you. I don't know how many of us fully understood it, to be brutally honest, but that was absolutely brilliant, even with the scary maths. <laughs>